Hi everyone and welcome to my channel. My name is Amber and this is Fundy Free. Today, we have a very special guest today, Emily Elizabeth Anderson with us, who runs Thriving Forward, who has a fantastic outreach ministry for those who are deconstructing. And she's all, she's been very open with her story. And thank you so much for being on here, Emily. Thank you, Amber. I'm excited about it. I love what you're doing here. And uh, I'm excited for this conversation. I am too. I'm really excited. So I'm really basic with my questions and we'll just kind of see how this goes today. So tell me, um, tell our listeners kind of like your background, um, where you started or what you remember with growing up in um, your religion or your belief system. Yeah, so I grew up in what you would call a Christian household. Um, my parents went to pretty, pretty strict fundamentalist churches growing up I was I was we were part of this one church where it was both a church and a school and so from first through fourth grade I attended that private Christian school and that church was our whole life and we went every single Sunday and we were a part of you know all the different extra activities they had and that's the environment that I grew up in it was I believe just considered a Baptist church, but it was definitely very fundamentalist in its belief system and um, pretty legalistic too. And when I uh, was about ready to join the fifth grade, we ended up leaving that church. And that same year, my mom decided that she was going to start homeschooling me. And so we joined Bill Gothard's Institute in Basic Life Principles. Uh, it was actually his homeschool organization called ATI, or the Advanced Training Institute. And <laughs> the ironic thing is my mom joined ATI in hopes that we would be escaping some of the legalism at our home church. And we had no idea that in reality we were jumping from, you know, the frying pan into the fire. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so we yeah. we were members of ATI all the way through the rest of my homeschooling until I was you know, 18 years old. Um, and I uh, part part of ATI is you join you join their program and you study their homeschool material every single morning, which was called the Wisdom Booklets. So we did that, but then also they have regional conferences every year. They have a handful of them throughout the U.S. during the summertime, and that's where families can congregate for the week. And they have, I mean, it's almost like a, it's almost like a Bible conference. And so they would have, mm -hmm. it was like four solid days. And they would have um, a program for the little, little kids, and then they would have like preteens, and then your teens, and then your adults, and then we'd also have group sessions where all the families were together, and <clears throat> um, it was just like four solid days of messages, and they covered uh, a wide variety of topics. It could be everything from finances to how to have conversations, difficult conversations with your spouse to uh, topics ranging in purity and courtship um, and just about everything else under the sun. Everything was tied to the Bible in some way or another. <clears throat> and at these conferences, Bill Gothard would spot me out of a crowd of you know, a couple thousand people and it started for the first time when I was 13 and he was in his early 70s and he spotted me and asked me to quit homeschool and go up to IBLP headquarters and work there a full time. And this was common occurrence. Um, mm -hmm. It was considered the highest honor in ATI for a girl to be asked to come up and work at headquarters. Because you're, I mean, we saw Bill, we, we used to call him the modern day Apostle Paul. 
he was as close as you could get to what we would say a prophet. And we thought he had special revelations from God and that he was just the most perfect, amazing, godly man on the planet. And so what an honor for your impressionable teenager to be working alongside this man of God and do ministry alongside him. So it was a huge deal. Um, But my mom uh, was not like most parents and she was not flattered in the way that a lot of parents were. (laughs) And um, I, another part of my story is I have Crohn's disease and I, I was diagnosed at 13. So Bill spotted me just months after my diagnosis. And um, yeah, uh, my mom's p- p- part of the uh, ministry that he wanted me to join was actually like a missionary team that went all over the world. And my mm. mom's like, you know, third world countries and Crohn's don't mix very well. Um, so she's like, we are trying to get her disease stable right now. She's really not in the position to be able to move away from home. My mom was my full-time caretaker. So we told him that we would consider it in the future, but I need to get healthier first. And every year after that, he would continue to approach me. And the really funny thing is he never remembered who I was. It was a brand new, yes, it was a brand new experience every year. It was like deja vu where suddenly he would just spot me and he like had no recollection of who I was and would want to know my name and would, he would just ask me to come to headquarters and I would like remember remind him i'm like yeah you've asked me for the last three years so he would have no idea who i was um yeah that really proves he had a type he had a very very defined type and i fit it right. um and anyway after several years we did finally end up going to headquarters for 10 days it was both me and my mom and we were going to go up there just for counseling from bill um Mm-hmm. because my father was very abusive. He was sexually abusive for me, w- with me from the age of like 11 into my early 20s. And I believe that's what triggered the Crohn's disease. And so the unfortunate thing about growing up in these fundamentalist circles is crimes are never seen as crimes they're seen as inappropriate behavior and they're seen as need to be dealt with in the church because when you're raised in this tight tight bubble you think the outside world social workers police detectives courts they're all worldly and secular and dangerous and they don't follow the bible uh and so of course even though it was common knowledge in my community that my dad was very abusive. Um, I don't know if a lot of people knew about the sexual abuse. My mother knew, but it was still thought that this needs to be dealt with in a spiritual way. And my Mm -hmm. father just needed counseling and he needed a come to Jesus moment. Uh, and it never really crossed anybody's mind that criminal behavior is happening. And really we need to go to the police because he needs to go to prison. Right. And exactly. never occurred to anybody. Yeah. So we went up to headquarters because it was basically what we thought was our last hope. If, cause we had tried for years, my mom had tried for years to, uh, talk to various counselors, get my dad into counseling and nothing was ever working. And, you know, in our minds, like the one person on earth who can help our family is Bill Gothard. So we went up there for 10 days and it did not go well. Um, Bill basically said he would, he refused to help us unless my mom went back home and I stayed at headquarters by myself and we wouldn't do that. And Mm -hmm. eventually I realized that he was wanting me to sell myself. There was a price to pay. He was offering help. He was offering the golden ticket. He was offering all of these lavish promises and he was offering to rescue our family. But the price was me. And now that I have full understanding of who Bill was, I realized that he wanted me, he wanted my body. 
mm-hmm. um, because all of his behavior over these years was actually sexual grooming and sexual abuse. And it never really crossed into assault. Um, but I do think that it would have eventually right. if, if I had, if he had gotten me alone, you know, if he had made stayed there and my mom had been gone and I had my cell phone taken away, I had no way of contacting home, then he could do whatever he wanted. And that happened to a lot of young women at the headquarters yeah. over the years. And they've shared their stories online. But I, I can relate that that's the, that's where I was headed to, you know, mm-hmm. and that's eventually what was probably going to happen. But I had a mom who wasn't willing to leave me up there. And so after 10 days, we came back home with no help <laughs> from Bill. And um, things just got worse at home. And my dad eventually left. And my mom and I were on our own and had to had defend for ourselves, which is very difficult because um, she had been out of the workforce for you know, 30 years, um, or at least 20, at least 20 years raising, no, it was more. Yeah. She'd been out of the workforce for 30 years, raising her family. And I didn't have a college education. I didn't have a means of making, um, very good income. And so it was very difficult for a few years when you're very poor, you come up with extremely creative things to survive. Yes, you do. <laughs> yes, you do. <laughs> uh, yes. And um, a few years later, in the midst of all this struggle, is when I came across a website called Recovering Grace. And they, I really think, were some of the first. I think they founded in July of 2011. And I really think they were like one of the first uh, groups online that really started talking about the dangers of fundamentalist Christianity and of patriarchy mm-hmm. and really started to call out some of these teachings for how dangerous they really were. And they were the first ones to ever say Bill Gothard is, or his, his organization is a cult. Mm-hmm. And so I came across that website, read stories, uh, and it was a very slow process. But over the course of three years, I finally came to the realization that I had been targeted and abused, that these teachings are not biblical, that I was raised in a cult. And uh, in 2015, I ended up joining a lawsuit against Bill and IBLP, Mm -hmm. um, along with 18 other victims. And we fought in that lawsuit for five years um, and concluded in 2020. And at that point, I started driving forward and felt this intense need and desire to share my story and get the word out there, you know, how dangerous some of these groups are. And that's where I am today. (laughs) We've created this (laughs) beautiful community online of survivors and everyone is in a different place. And some people are really struggling with their faith and some people have walked away from their faith entirely. And I get that and all are welcome because it's this very, very messy process, deconstruction, and you kind of zigzag all over the place until eventually 10 years later, you kind of figure out where you're going to land, you know, but it's a messy process. And yes, I look at it like a pendulum. Like I was over here and then I just swung way yeah. over here to this other side. And then somehow 15 years later, I'm like kind of settling right here in the middle. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's important to have that growth and to continue to grow every single year. I don't think you just start to deconstruct from what you were raised in. And then like two years later, you're like, okay, now I have all the answers. Like, no, you're going to continue to grow for decades to come. We're supposed to. And it's important to be able to look back and say, hey, I don't believe what I believed five years ago. And, And to continue that process. But it's really neat to see all these survivors come together and watch where they are and hear the stories. And, um, it's beautiful to have a new community after walking away from everything that I was raised in. Yeah. I mean, cause we're, we're so ingrained that we have to stay inside of our community that whenever we walk away, we feel very like alone in the abyss because we lose that community. 
And now having your platform, you now have this ability to have like almost a new community where people can kind of come full circle back to almost so they don't feel quite so alone out in the abyss Mm -hmm. because it is very scary to walk away It is um, is. because you lose everything like socially um support wise like family wise a lot of times like you lose everything yeah and you're starting from the ground up and then at the same time you're like okay do I still believe in God I mean I don't even like you're questioning all of these things yeah and you're alone and then oh. realizing you get online and go oh i'm not alone this person felt felt the same way i did and this yeah. is where they are now and they're okay that means i'm going to be okay too maybe yeah. <laughs> right yeah. yes exactly um i mean that's recovering grace is what started it all for me and realizing that there was a community um <laughs> of healthy, safe people that had left ATI yes. because when you're, when you grow up in a cult, you're taught that anyone who is not a part of your cult is dangerous. Yes. They're not a real believer. Yes. They're not real Christians. Uh, and so to come into this community that has all left ATI and some of them are still very passionate followers of Christ. It was like, Oh wow. Like you can do that. I didn't know that. <laughs> Right, right. Yeah, that was just is very much an us versus them. Even like independent Baptists are like, if that other independent Baptist church isn't exactly like this one, they're wrong. So they really encapsulate you in this mindset that everything is evil and dangerous. And so getting out yes. of that, realizing that in their attempt to protect you from the evil of the world, they're really <laughs> they're really hurting you in the process. And it's really not that out here that's evil. It's what's inside that, that, um, that cult system that is evil and hurtful. And it's like yeah. the total opposite of what they're saying they're trying to do. Yeah. I mean, really what they're doing is cutting you off from the body of Christ. Mm-hmm. You basically have a community yeah. of like, you know, just hands or something. Like that. Yes, we're all hands. I well, I'm more like a big toe. So. Right, right, yeah, something like we're all just like one identical thing, and you're cutting yourself off from the beauty of a larger community. And I, I really think that the church is not about one single building or a group of people that congregate in one building. The church extends far beyond that. And so while I do have a traditional church that I attend now, I also see this online community that I'm a part of as the church as well. Yes. And it's beautiful and healing to have these conversations with others and hear their journey and where they've come from and where they are right now and to be able to wrestle hard questions together and to be able to empathize and sympathize with one another's experiences. I mean, it's just, I think this is what Jesus wanted all along when he wanted yes. fellow believers to congregate with each other, whether that be in person or having a conversation over the phone, you know? <laughs> yes. Yeah. And cause you know, if you think about it, your body is like so diverse and so there's so many things that are so, that may not be connected, but they all work together. And to have, like you said, like a whole church full of toes or hands. Right, right. (laughs) What are we doing? What are we doing to really reach people being all hands or being all feet? Like having this massive diversity, we have this ability to reach people and and where they are with all of these different ways. Because we're not, we're not containing God in this box anymore. Yeah, we're letting God be who he is, which is more than what we can ever imagine he is. Mm-hmm. And through all of these different ways, does that yeah. make sense? Sometimes I ramble. So. No, it does. It does. And I think it's important um, to have fellowship with those that don't believe in the exact same theology that you do. Yes. Um, because ultimately, like, there are a lot of things we just don't know the answer to, and we're not going to know the answer to until we're reunited Mm -hmm. with Christ. Uh, And so it's just so crazy when you're involved in this cult, not only can you 
only have fellowship with people who believe the exact same theology, but also it became a matter of who dress the same way as you and who listen to the same kind yeah. of music that you do and use the same kind of language and have all of these uh, quote convictions, uh, you yes. know, and it's like not only now have I realized that I can still have um, conversation and connect with others who have different um who live a different lifestyle, but then I also realize that I can still also connect with them, even if we vary on very on certain theological points too. Exactly, because at the end of the day, you know what? What are the, does it really matter? Unless right. I mean, as long as we're loving God, loving Jesus, and loving our fellow man as He taught us to, which is love our neighbor as ourselves. And how much do we love ourselves? That is like the biggest commandment that we're supposed to follow. Yep. You know, and I always wondered, you know, whenever I was still in our cult, um, because we were supposed to be set aside like peculiar people, right? We had to be right? very different, very different, dress that certain way, look that certain way. I'm like, how do in we order reach to attract people? attention? Yes. But I'm like, how do we reach people who are not like us that we can't even talk to them? Because if we talk to them, we're appearing evil because we're like associating with these types of people i'm like it was very double-minded very double speak yes. um cognitive dissonance i think is like the psychological term for it but i'm like mm -hmm. it there was so many things that were so contradictory compared to what christ teachings are and how we were required to live because it was very performance based yes like very um I remember looking back, I look back and I remember, you know, how miserable we we are because my, my, my dad was very abusive too, how miserable we were at home. But as soon as we stepped out that door, it was, we're happy, good Christian people. We dress right. We know the words to say. We have the right vernacular. We go in and we praise God just like everybody else and go home and we're hurting again. I mean, and, and I wonder how many people out there still in it are that way because it's so heavily based on your performance. Yes, I really think so. Um, I don't know if you were taught this, but I remember being told that you need to, and this kind of, they kind of brought in the verses about, um, oh, I'm blanking out a little bit. Um, <sighs> a second what's the verse okay in job? you're good okay okay they would they would bring in like the verse from job the lord gives the lord take of the way blessed be the name of the lord and it was this yes. idea of we need to be thankful for all circumstances because that's mm -hmm. our witness is what we were told uh and so we could never have hard vulnerable conversations it wasn't okay to cry about things or to mm -hmm. have um difficult emotions, anything other than being happy and joyful and grateful all the time. You had yes. to be those things because otherwise you were told that you were damaging the, the your witness for Christ. Because if people yes. saw that you were angry over something or you were grieving over something, like for heaven's sake, mothers that had a miscarriage, they couldn't even grieve over that miscarriage. They instead had to continue to be happy and joyful and say all the right Christian platitudes instead of being... Yes you know, honest with their grief, because if you're being honest with your grief, then that shows that you don't have, you know, the joy of Christ in your life or whatever they want to come up with. Uh, it's just crazy how so many natural, healthy human emotions were stunted. Yes. Being told that you can't have those or else people, you know, are not going to be drawn to a life with Christ. It's crazy. It is because it's so inauthentic. My dad's philosophy was always, it's in the past. You just need to forget about it and, and just be happy now. Cause you know, it doesn't matter what I did yesterday. Yeah. You need to be okay now because I'm not doing it today. Yeah. Just forgive it and let it go and let's be happy again. And <laughs> I have friends now that are still in and you know, they will go through hard times and like, well, we're trying not to complain. But this is bothering me today, but I feel really bad. I'm complaining. I'm like, don't feel bad. You're allowed to be angry because someone hurt you or someone did this. You are allowed to have that space. Christ was even angry and upset right. at times. Right? That's and the thing. He grieved. 
he did. He cried when Lazarus died, and he's God. He knew Lazarus was going to die. Right. He cried anyway. And he just knew he was about ready to resurrect him, too. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. I know. I know. Like, I want people to know that the Jesus that we, that I follow, that, that I, I hope they're following, is the one who turned over the tables and yes. walked away from toxic people and took a stand against legalism. And mm-hmm. um, I, he, he sought out the most vulnerable in society and ministered to them and it didn't always look pretty and it usually broke social norms but that's I mean that's the real Jesus and that's the example that we should be following it's not all pretty and tied up in a perfect Mm -mm. nice bow it is messy exactly and God who created us understands our humanity and that is what I truly believe and he understands and it's for and is okay with us having our, our our range of emotions that he gave us. I do not think that our emotions are sinful. I don't yeah. think there's a, a morality tied to our emotions. We're just human. Yeah. And I think and and it's such a disservice to think that God, who made us this way, then punishes us for having our human reactions. Yeah. And that's how we were taught. We were taught that our human reactions were sinful. Yeah. Unless you were keeping sweet and being happy and being submissive and being yeah. a good girl. Right. Right. And I was really bad at being a good girl. <laughs> I was always <laughs> low key rebellious. <laughs> even though bad, like, you know, like, in oh, the oh I get mind, it. I'm like, this doesn't make sense to me. Like, even yeah. at like 10, 11, 12, 13, I'm like, why doesn't this make sense? Why are we being ugly like this? I don't understand. Yeah. See, I and, wish I was like that, but I was total brainwashed, and um, I was very much the the perfect child and followed all the rules. I loved oh, the rules. <laughs> yes, I did because of how my my dad operated our household. Like I was very outwardly good, very outwardly performative, and I met across all the eyes. No, 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 all the eyes cross all the T's. I said that backwards, but um, as I sometimes it would just pop up in my mind like why are we doing this this doesn't make sense Mm -hmm. you know you're saying one thing but we're acting a different way and it was like this weird headspace to be in and on and i actually have disassociative amnesia so there's a lot of things i don't remember from like my ptsd and everything from Mm -hmm. growing up but the things that i do remember i'm like even then i kind of questioned in like the back of my mind why 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 is it this way why are we acting this way towards people why are we better than these people we're we're not any better you know yeah, yeah. and um i remember whenever my husband and i moved to germany whenever he he joined the military we moved to germany right shortly after he joined the military hmm. and it was my first time away from the bible belt bubble and you go to europe and everything is naked Literally, the <laughs> breasts are not like considered a sexual body part in Europe. So yeah. you will drive down the road, you'll see just boobies on a billboard. I mean, it's just what it is. Like I was so traumatized. There was like a sex <laughs> shop inside the launch stool airport whenever I got off the airplane, and I was like, I was like this innocent twenty, like two year old or twenty year old going, "What is going on in my life?" I'm like, there was wow. just so much being bombarded, and I remember being so holier than thou with the other military families around me because I'm like, I can't be like them. I can't, I'm not drinking. I'm not, you know, doing this. I'm not watching this type of stuff. I'm not talking this way. And so I really isolated myself trying to be the Christian witness Mm -hmm. and harmed a lot of relationships that I probably could have had while I was there. Yeah. It is sad. It does the opposite. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, it does. It, it pushes people away from Jesus versus drawing them in. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. That I have found. Yeah. And so are you, um, is there anything like now that like you find the most helpful? Do you, you do you do like, and this may be a personal question. We can cut this out if you don't, if you don't want to talk about, it. do you do like therapy? Do you really encourage 
therapy for people because I've been in therapy for like 10 years. It's like been a lifesaver for me. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Um, I do recommend therapy. 100%. Yes. And um, I really recommend seeking a certified therapist or psychologist, mm-hmm. um, something along that lines versus just seeking counseling from your pastor or an elder. I mean, they have, they have a, yeah, they have a very different job and they're not trained yes. in, they're not trained in the same way a therapist is trained by any means. Um, and also mm-hmm. even seeking a biblical counselor. Now I, the first person I worked with was a biblical family counselor and it was extremely helpful. Um, because I was still of the belief system that therapists are dangerous and they're bad because they're secular. Mm-hmm. And or even if a Christian therapist, it's like, still. Yes, they're the humanistic. Whole, they're going to yes, fill your yes. head with mess. Right. Yeah. All the whole like study of um, psychology is supposed to be very anti-Christian. Yes. <laughs> and so the first person That's what I happened to me. I went to one. Right. <laughs> That's my whole problem. <laughs> Here I am. <laughs> oh, I love it. So yeah, the first guy I worked with was a biblical counselor, but it was actually good because it was all I could handle at the time. It felt safe. And um, he worked with Bill Gothard back in the 80s. Uh, mm-hmm. And so he actually like knew the system. He knew Bill personally, first of all, knew how Bill's brain worked which was really important for me to understand. And then also Mm -hmm. he he knew IBLP and knew what the belief system was. And I think a lot of survivors who have been to a therapist can understand how difficult it it is to be able to thoroughly explain the belief system to a therapist. And like, Mm -hmm. you're, you're going to spend several months just shocking your therapist. I have stuff. so many times the look on the face of my therapist, especially right now. Like, she's like, it's like her, her. She's like speechless. So I'm like, it's okay. That's a normal reaction. It's fine. It's fine. Right. Right. <laughs> yes. Yeah. So I didn't have any of that. Thank goodness. And it was helpful because I was struggling with my faith and having having a quote biblical counselor like was was helpful because he was able to help me deconstruct some of the false theology that I was raised in. Mm-hmm. So that was very good. And I worked with him um for a couple of years but then I got hit with very severe PTSD. And I mean like oh my gosh, the summer of 2018, my body just crashed. I was cleaning houses for a living, which in and of itself is difficult work, very difficult for somebody mm-hmm. with chronic illness. But I was cleaning houses and um, I ended up collapsing one day and was stuck in bed for three weeks, barely had the energy to even get up and use the bathroom. Um, I was having constant panic attacks. I was having nightmares. I was terrified to go out in public. I mean, I my whole body just crashed. And the physical symptoms that came up were insane. I had a constant resting heart rate of 145 oh for my about a solid nine months. And I got winded walking even just 10 steps. Um, I had constant muscle twitching. Um, I felt like I was having a heart attack multiple times where I get intense chest pain and would feel panicky. I mean, my body was a wreck and it was actually my biblical counselor who said, yeah, I, you've got PTSD. And so that's when I saw out a licensed therapist and started working mm-hmm. with them and I actually started EMDR therapy, eye movement desensitization yes. and reprocessing therapy, which has, oh my gosh, it was a lifesaver. It brought my PTSD symptoms down by about 90%. That's and, fantastic. Yeah. In like just a year. I mean, it was amazing. Um, and at the time that I was doing EMDR, I was like preparing to testify in court against Bill too, which was immensely helpful because all the work that we did for several months through EMDR got me to the point that I could sit in a witness stand, stare Bill Gothard in the eye, and I didn't shudder at all. Like, it was amazing. That's awesome. Yes, considering That's amazing. that just the tiniest things in my environment six months prior, like, so so Bill, Bill only ever wore suits. 
black suits that all he, that's all he wore. He never wore once wore anything casual. And so um, I still like find black suits triggering, but it was really bad to where if I would see somebody in a black suit in the corner of my eye out in public, I would like instantly go into a panic attack. So yeah. the fact that I went from that to like testifying in court and not panicking was amazing. And that's, that's, that's so awesome. That's what therapy and EMDR can do. It's, yes. <laughs> yes. And so um, I do recommend people working with a qualified therapist. And then also, um, and I, I'm grateful because right now, I think especially in like, especially in the last 10 years, and especially with millennials, I have seen this pattern where therapy is no longer taboo in the way that I think mm -hmm. it used to be. And I really think that everyone can benefit from it because everyone grows up with some kind of dysfunctional pattern that they saw witnessed in their family. Even if your family was quite healthy as a whole, like mm -hmm. every family's got at least a few quirks in them of some kind of dysfunctional pattern. And it's usually passed on generation to generation. And mm -hmm. I think it's really important uh, that we have self-awareness of that. We recognize that and that we're willing to go through therapy so that we don't continue to pass it on. Yes. Into the generation. Absolutely. Like I, um, I mean, yeah, I've, I've had a lot of family dysfunction. I've had to, work through um but i'm i married a really um really wonderful guy a really healthy guy who's loved me really well um but even then like just because we've had a healthy equal safe loving relationship most of the time that doesn't mean that toxic patterns haven't creeped up in our own marriage mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and dysfunctional patterns of communication and all that. And so we've worked with therapists together. We've worked also with like coaches um, together uh, because we don't want, we, we want to, we want to nip it in the bud. We want to catch it early. We don't want this to become, uh, we don't want toxic patterns to build up over years, turning into contempt, turning into resentment. Uh, and then, you know, before you know it, you're 20 years down the road and it's so much harder to work things out yes. at that point because so many years of damage rather it's like okay a few months a few we, we started a business together and that that's really what like <laughs> brought, brought things to the surface <laughs> and a few months yes. of starting starting this business together we're like yeah we need help we don't know what we're doing <laughs> Oh yeah, I kind of don't want to work with you all the time, so we need to work through this. <laughs> right? And so we started working with professionals, and it's amazing to see mm -hmm. what what the difference is gleaning from people that have so much wisdom to give. And it's like, okay, yeah, now we can work together as partners. <laughs> Absolutely. And it's so important to get a good person or, or a qualified person in for the marriage counseling because we've had marriage counseling done by pastors before and it's been horrible. I mean, I mean, I'm not saying that every pastor is doing marriage counseling is horrible, but right. for the most part, they're not, I don't think they're qualified for, <laughs> for communication skills. And most of them have the patriarchy already instilled in them. So they have mm -hmm. that very off balance. I know that whenever it was about the 11 year mark in my mine and my husband's marriage and we had a really rough patch and so we decided to do counseling and i've always struggled with my self-worth like always and i think it's just very much ingrained from our background being told how worthless we are plus everything else layered on top of that mm -hmm. um and i told my pat told the pastor i was like you know i struggle thinking because i'm not i don't feel like i'm good enough for my husband because my husband is a really good man like he I really lucked out because I could have married so differently. Um, and he's he's just a great person. He's very much into being a partner, you know, the patriarchy. He's like, throw it all out. He's like, let's right. burn the bras together kind of thing, <laughs> right. you know? And so I was telling my the pastor about it and he looks at me and he was like, you don't deserve anything good. Mm. Like that was the word that came out of his mouth. Oh. And he was like, you should be thankful for what God gave you and appreciate it um, instead of complaining about the issues that you have. Mm. Mm -mm. 
And I'm like, well, I'm not coming back to you again. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> there's that. <laughs> but that was so triggering. I was just like, oh my gosh, people still say this, you know, because yeah. I remembered it. And it was like our, like the pastor from the church that we just left. And I thought he was different, which made that was like the kind of the beginning of the end of us starting to realize we needed to move out, move our way out. Mm -hmm. um, and because I'm like, if he's saying this to me, like, what is he going to say to my children whenever they're, if they come to him for anything kind of thing? Um, and so I'm glad that you guys got like good marriage counseling. So now you guys don't kill each other at work. Right. You know, you do have like, <laughs> you have saws. Um, there's a lot of dangerous things around you. Oh. Yeah, we, we own a woodworking business. So yeah. Yes. Oh, boy. <laughs> He, and, he you could know, be like JL, I'm like, where's my <laughs> hammer and my, where I can drive something in a temple somewhere. <laughs> oh gosh, good gosh. <laughs> uh, what, another thing that I think is really important to differentiate is somebody who is almost unintentionally passing on dysfunctional behaviors that they witnessed growing up versus somebody with what I call the heart of an abuser. And mm -hmm. when I, when I work with a lot of survivors on my, that follow my page and that reach out to me personally, um, for where they are most of the time, I rarely, rarely recommend marriage counseling. Right. Um, because when you have an abusive situation going on where you have, where somebody actually has the heart of an abuser mm -hmm. versus somebody who has a safe heart um, but they are unintentionally passing on even some abusive behaviors, but that's yeah. not, it's not really who they are. And I think it's so important to differentiate that. But when you have a couple where and it's usually where the husband, it's not always, but most of the time, the husband truly has the heart of an abuser is very dangerous, is very manipulative. And then you have the wife who's trying everything in her power to try to fix things. Yes. And I do not recommend marriage counseling in those situations no. because a lot of times um, abusers are really, really great at manipulating the story, getting a, even a professional, getting a professional onto their side and then just placing more and more blame on the wife who, even if she mm -hmm. has, um, I don't really like the term reactive abuse because it's, it's kind of a loaded term, but even, yes. um, when you've got someone who's been in an abusive situation for so long to where they start reacting in ways that might be considered abusive, but really it's just, they're, they're, they're a trapped animal in a cage, essentially, you know, mm -hmm. um, even when that's happening, like sometimes these abusers are really good at getting there uh using that against their victim and making it look like it's all the victim's fault so i yeah. really recommend individual counseling but if you got a couple where both um have safe hearts and they actually want to take ownership over their own um mm -hmm. actions they want yes. to grow their heart is tender. They are ready to learn from others and actually take responsibility and change. When you've got that, yeah. I think a really good healthy combination is for each person to have their own individual therapist and then to have someone yes. that can do like group relationship therapy, counseling, 100%. whatever, marriage counseling. Yes. Yeah. So that way you're working on your own childhood stuff, but then you're also coming together and learning how to have healthy communication and healthy conflict resolution and all that. But yes. as I said, when you've got this imbalance where you've got really an abuser and then the victim, I don't ever recommend bringing them together. Really, mm -hmm. the victim just needs to get counseling. The abuser's not going to not gonna get therapy on their own, but the victim no. needs to get therapy to to help them build healthy boundaries, to understand exactly what they're going through and to possibly help them to come up with an escape plan if needed. Mm -hmm. 100%. And I'm so glad that you clarified that because it is really important to know the difference between having a partner who's willing to grow with you and a partner who is actually abusing you. Yes. And that's whether you're male or female because uh, 
they will they will manipulate the system to make you look like you're the crazy one and the mm-hmm. one that's doing all the wrong and yeah. so i'm so glad that you clarified that because yeah. that is so important to know because that happened with my own parents situation my dad's like my dad is a textbook narcissist and that's what he would do he would manipulate the story and it would not matter it would just be always on my mom that all the things fell on to yeah. same in my and, family mm-hmm. you and know there was a really even, sad situation there was even one crazy time now this guy was not a therapist he was a counselor <clears throat> and supposed to be a biblical counselor and we met as a family with one session and i told at this point like i was in my early 20s and i told him that my dad had been sexually abusive and in that meeting he actually like looked at my dad and he's like is this true because men go to prison for this and so this counselor recognized that and and he said, I, and he spoke to my dad and he's like, I need to see you alone for the next session. And unfortunately, what do you think happened? Well, my dad yeah. swam him over to his side. Suddenly I became the bitter lying daughter. And that counselor mm-hmm. was actually the one who told my father to pull all the money and to leave and leave me and my mom destitute like it's crazy how Mm -hmm. much destruction some of these so-called counselors can do yes yeah it's it's really sad because they they hold so much power whenever it comes to these types of situations that it's just really sad the outcomes that can happen yeah yeah because I remember with my own my own dad with with the sexual abuse as I got older, it was because I was dressing as a Jezebel because <laughs> my skirts were too short, and I was wearing makeup. Mm-hmm. So of course, victim blaming was fan was a, a fantastic thing to go through, <laughs> right? Wow, I'm so sorry. Oh, it's it's. I almost said it's okay, but it's not okay. You know what I mean? But it's, it's not okay. It's like one it's of those okay. things that you process through and you're like even though I would tell I I talked to somebody about it at the time and and it was someone in the ministry and they just basically told me you know you need to pray about it and pray that God would soften your father's heart and change his heart that was it that was the counseling I got I've heard that there was there's no there was no other help outside of that and I'm just like okay so in other words I can't go to anyone no one's going to believe me no mm-hmm. one is going to care enough to help me. So why am I telling people? Yeah. And so I just shut down. I shut down. I didn't talk to anybody about it for a really long time. Mm-hmm. A really, really yeah. long time. Yeah. Yeah. I see it a lot right. in these churches. Mm-hmm. Like what I yeah. said at, at the beginning of this, um, crimes are not seen as crimes, but at the most they'll be seen as inappropriate behavior. Yeah. If they're going to put any kind of, blame on the these are which they rarely do Mm -hmm. there was only one time in my entire in my entire life being in churches because i've I've seen churches like shun people as they left right Mm -hmm. but there's supposed to be a biblical way to shun people if they don't repent from their sins right there was this one church this one pastor was the only time in my entire life that actually did it that way because the guy who was married was trying to Get with the pastor's daughter who was oh. not married. She just oh. she was eighteen. Wow. Yeah. And so he actually it was the first time in my <laughs> life I actually saw a pastor go before a church, expose an abuser, and shun him from our church. I had never seen that in my entire life, and I've never seen it since. Yeah. And I was like, that's really bad because I've been in a lot of churches with a lot of abusers. I, one of the churches I went to, I went to, through, to a lot of churches growing up because my dad was an evangelist as a cover to so he could run from the law because mm-hmm. he was like on the run my whole life. Um, and this one church, the pastor was actually in an incestuous relationship with his daughter from the time she was about five until he got caught when she was 35. Hmm. Hmm. And, and I'm just like, they're everywhere. 
it's everywhere and nobody yeah. talks about it. We are. Nobody yeah. talks about it. Yeah. So yeah. I think I've had five total pastors and all but one have been terrible abusers. Mm -hmm. I had one pastor who uh, had a sexual relationship with a congregation member for 10 years. Oh and then gosh. they both conspired together and killed the woman's husband. The pastor committed murder. Oh, yeah. my word. Well, he's serving life in prison. <clears throat> well, yeah, but, good. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but, like, like, I mean, that's some of these people behind these pulpits. Like, yes. It's, um, it's fascinating because I, I know of perpetrators and predators that are found out in churches and then they're moved, especially in the IFB, since they don't have, like, you know, that governing body overhead. Yes. They get moved silently around yep. to different, and a lot. a lot of them are youth ministers around mm -hmm. young children. Mm -hmm. And I remember whenever I, I moved out at 20, 21, um, cause I just couldn't take it anymore. I moved out and the church I went to was still a very strict IFB. I was a bit of a black sheep because I was a female who was no longer under the headship of my father. And I'd moved out, but, um, and so the youth pastor took a very particular interest in me and had me over to his house and made advances while his wife was upstairs making dinner. And I'm just like, what? Mm -hmm. And at that point I was just like, I'm not doing this anymore. You know? And I, I left the church. I never, I didn't say anything. I probably should have. You know, you think back, you know, but in the moment you're like, who's going to believe me anyway? So I might as well just, just leave. Right. You know, yeah. and go on. Yeah. Yeah. It's crazy though. But that's, you know, that's a lot of the reasons I'm, I'm kind of starting this platform is, you know, to give voice to people, you know, and I, I know that you're kind of doing that with your ministry, like I, I, a ministry, do you call it a ministry or your, I do. your platform? Yeah. yeah, my ministry, your ministry is to give voice to these people and like, you know, help them realize it's what it's you're not by yourself. You're really right? not you yeah, you you have support because we understand. We we yeah. got you. I mean, we empathize, we understand because yeah. those people are crazy. Okay. I, I had one reader comment and it was a it was respectful. Um innocent question but she commented uh, a few days ago and i guess she was like brand new uh brand new follower and she's like is this page anti-religion or anti-christianity because i had had several string uh, strings of posts in a row um like exposing a lot of the toxic yeah. stuff in in churches yeah. and she's like you know i'm just really curious and i said well no it's not and i said now we we do expose a lot of the um, toxic issues going on in churches nowadays. Um, and I said, because it's so important that survivors have a place to finally be able to share their story because all these years, this abuse has happened to them within a Christian environment and they haven't been able to actually even voice it, you know, to be, yes. be able to have a safe platform to say, this church harmed me this pastor almost destroyed my faith. Like to be able to say that and not have any judgment on them and not to say, oh, well, you're following men and not God. Or like, well, you weren't really following right. the Bible. Like, oh my gosh, those, yeah. that does not help at all. No, it doesn't. Uh, it doesn't. <laughs> that's just funny. It doesn't. Blame on the victim. <laughs> but it's so healing, so cathartic to be able to voice and say, this is what actually happened. And then to be able to say either, um, my relationship with Jesus got me through it, or I am not sure where I am in faith or mm -hmm. even say like, I've walked away at this point. Um, yeah. But still just, it's so healing to be able to actually say, this is what happened. And um, in a, mm -hmm. I guess you would say non-judgmental environment. Yeah. And to have people come alongside and say, I am so sorry you went through that. It was mm -hmm. wrong. It should have never happened. And you're not mm -hmm. alone because that's happened to a lot of other people too. Yes. Yeah. I know I, like sometimes whenever I talk to people and I just hear their stories and I, I have found those like just interviewing people, you know, kind of building content for this channel. I 
listening to them, I relate so much to the story in some aspects that I'm like, it's actually healing listening to them because mm-hmm. I'm just like, oh my gosh, I understand that feeling. I understand that emotion. I, I mean, it may not be the exact same path that I walked, but those emotions are very much similar. Yes. And it's healing in itself in that community, just being able to communicate and verbalize. For so many years, we were silenced, especially women mm-hmm. were silenced that now we have this ability to talk about it. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And we're finding out that we're not the only ones. Yeah. And, yeah. you know, we're burning down the patriarchy together. <laughs> right. right. <laughs> you know, it's also been really beautiful to see. I, I, the majority, like 95% of my uh, followers are female, but I do have that 5% that are men. And um, abuse against males, especially against um, boys, young, you know, young boys is not talked about, but it certainly no, happens. it's not. Certainly yes. happens. It does. And it's also been very... Um, it's hard, but it's also in a way beautiful to see um, these grown men now be able to share some of their stories and say how they were abused as young boys in the church. Mm-hmm. And also to have other men talk about how they were once abusers and they were once part yes. of the system. And to have a yes. safe place where they're able to say, I recognize now that I, I added to the abuse of women. I added to the silencing and I believed all this patriarchal crap against women and I perpetuated mm-hmm. this abuse, but I'm not that person anymore. And they're taking responsibility yeah. for their actions and they're turning it around. And now they're actually ministering and helping survivors. Like yes. that is beautiful to watch. Yes. Um, one of my favorite ones to follow right now is Path to Freedom with Ben. Do you, yes. do you I was thinking him? of I was yes, thinking of exactly. Ben. I was thinking of all this. He, yes. Like his transparency, because I've talked to him a little bit privately in chat, and he actually allowed me to share some of my story on his page of, about a year ago. And he his transparency is so refreshing and, and it is true. Like women are silenced, but young men and boys are even, I think sometimes even more so because they can't show any emotion at all. Women have that. They have this expectation. Women are emotional and that's kind of how they play into us being crazy and all over the place. But men can't be at all zero. They have to be these like tough, like ultra alpha male types. And a lot of times they have it worse, you know, they can have it worse than the women do sometimes. And I appreciate that Ben is so transparent with his story and that he owns a lot of like, everything that he's done that yeah. comes to mind and he talks it through. And I think that he's, he helps, like, I have not seen it like for myself, but I know, I know he has to help so many men out there yeah. that are kind of lost in this space or have not had a chance to tell their story. And I think it's fantastic that he's doing his ministry in that way. I do love it. Um, Hold on Mm -hmm. one second. I need to plug in my laptop before it dies. With us here at the end of of an hour, you know, I really appreciate you coming on. Is there any way, like, do you want to plug anything, anything you're working on particular? Of course, I want to link your, your Facebook page and all the information down below in the description box. But um, tell people where they can find you and kind of what you're working on yeah. if you're working on anything right now. Yeah. So I'm mostly on Facebook and I am um, starting to jump into the world of Instagram too. But it's just driving, <laughs> driving forward on Facebook. And um, I'm really excited. This this conversation today is happening at the end of December 2022. And I am starting a training program in January 2023. And it's going to last a year. And um, part of the program is like reading between 30 and 35 books. Um, And um, it's a personal mentorship program. And uh, at the end, I will actually be a certified coach. So a year from now, I'm looking forward to being able to coach and work with survivors one-on-one. Um, and so I'm, I'm really excited for everything that's going to happen with Thriving Forward in the next year, because as I'm reading all these books, I'm going to start sharing bits out of them and, um, um, 
yeah, I'm just, I'm excited to go through a major growth spurt and be able to pass it on and to share it, if you know what I mean. Yes, that is so exciting. I'm really excited about that. So I'm really excited to see how this, you know, this journey happens over the next year. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, exactly. We that can all learn great. together. We can grow together. Yes, exactly. I really appreciate your time coming on and talking with me today. It's been really encouraging and I've had a great conversation with you today. Yes, it's been wonderful. It's so natural to talk to other survivors. Um, yes. We just click. We just click. Yes, you know? we do. <laughs> we do. We understand each other. Yes. We can laugh at, about all the weird things that nobody else understands. <laughs> right? It's a beautiful thing. So thank you it so is. much for having me on. You're welcome. I love You're it. so welcome. Thank you all for listening today. I really appreciate you all taking your time. Don't forget to subscribe and like the video and share if you would like to. Hit the subscribe button um, so you can you don't miss any videos coming up. Everything's coming out once a week. If you want to share your story, um, the directions how to contact me for that is in the description box below. Until next time, everyone, everybody has a story. So what is yours? <laughs>